The Practices of Philosophy, a presentation on Hellenistic philosophy. We'll get the definition of uh, Hellenistic philosophy here in just a minute. But first, let's just dive right in with this aphorism from the Epicurean school uh, of Hellenistic philosophy. An aphorism, A-P-H-O-R-I-S-M, is a saying, and we're going to be looking at a lot of these sayings. They're short uh, pieces of wisdom that are easy to memorize and, and uh, easy to, to memorize a lot of them, and uh, so have sort of uh, spiritual resources in case of need. So this is the Epicurean tetrapharmakos, which literally means fourfold healing formula. Pharmakos is where we get the word pharmacy. So they say God presents no fears. Now this is a little confusing and not knowing what the original Latin was here, we have to maybe hazard a guess as to what Epicurus meant by uh, God. Did he mean one of the Olympian gods or Zeus specifically? Or did he mean a single highest god? Uh, probably if most people, if they know anything about ancient Greece, would know that about the Olympian gods. Zeus and Athena and Hera, etc. And therefore they would think that ancient Greece was a, po a polytheistic uh, society. Polytheism is the belief in more than one god. Um, and the Greeks certainly had polytheism. But oddly, at the same time, they had monotheism. They also had a single highest deity, sometimes called Zeus, but also sometimes just called Father uh, uh, or just God, uh, or by other names, Plato's the good, maybe, but Plato never said that the good was a divine being, or a, directly speaking, a god. Um, his followers did, certainly. But so exactly what uh, is meant by God here uh, is not clear. But in any case, God presents no fears because if it's Zeus or one of the Olympian gods, the Epicureans believed that they were over on Mount Olympus doing God stuff, and they didn't really care about human beings, so we have nothing to fear from them. They wouldn't get involved in human activities. Uh, and if it's the highest God, presents no fears uh, because this God is so transcendent and perfect uh, that really doesn't impact our life. Death presents no worries. Well, this might not seem very clear either. Uh, here we have a practice that we'll talk about uh, later on in the uh, presentation, uh, the meditation on death and on other future evils. This is a way to prepare for these evils, and if we are prepared uh, for death by meditation on it, then it, uh, right now should present us no worries. As Epicurus says, as long as we're alive, death isn't here. And when we're dead, we won't care anymore. So death presents no worries. And he goes on to mention that when we worry about death, we're not actually worried about death because death isn't a thing. And anyway, as he said, when death is here, you're not going to care about that anymore anyway. The fear that we have of death is actually the fear of things that we associate with death such as uh, pain and suffering uh, of, our, of ourselves in the de dying process, but also pain and suffering to loved ones, uh, loss of possessions, loss of projects, um, all of those kinds of things are what we really fear. But if we're prepared for those things, uh, if we have uh, prepared ourselves through meditation on, uh, you know, so that we can control ourselves when those eventualities occur, then death presents no worries. And good is readily attainable because the highest good that the Epicureans and coincidentally the Stoics taught, this is where they most agree, the Epicurean school and the Stoic school agree that the highest good is to control oneself uh, because it's impossible to control reality. And when we try to, what we wind up doing is uh, really creating um, upset for ourselves. We're becoming attached to uh, all the different scenarios that show up in the world and we're riding an emotional roller coaster. So if we can just control ourselves and let events be events and not put a meaning on them and then not attach uh, a, an emotion to that meaning, if we can just let the event be the event and control ourselves, then 
good is re readily attainable, and evil is readily endurable. So there was the famous example of this would be a, a Stoic one, actually. The, great, the greatest, really, of the Stoic philosophers, Epictetus, uh, was, uh, well, originally he was a Roman slave, and he was educated by his master and later freed by his master. And he had a philosophical school in Rome. But at one time they were torturing him. Uh, got on the wrong side of the emperor or something, and so they were torturing him. And the way they were doing this is they had him sitting on a table with his legs stretched out in front of him. And they had his foot in a vice that they could turn, thereby twisting his leg. Now, you can imagine how you'd feel if you were in this circumstance. You'd be scared out of your mind. You might be pleading. Uh, who knows how, how one might act perfectly justifiably. So what is Epictetus doing? He's sitting there, you know, boys, if you twist my leg, it's just going to break. And so they gave the vice a turn, <coughs> twisting his leg. Epictetus, well, boys, I'd say another couple turns like that ought to shatter the bone. They turn it again. <coughs> Epictetus, yeah, one more turn ought to do it. They turn it once more. There's the sound of a snapping bone. And Epictetus says, see, boys, I told you so. So he had absolute control over himself, even though he couldn't control his circumstances. So evil is readily endurable. So that's the Epicurean tetrapharmacos. Now we need to see where it fits in the rest of the scheme of Hellenistic philosophy. Already in Plato's time, uh, the Greek states were in a good deal of turmoil. During Plato's time, for example, there was the period called the Rule of the Forty Tyrants. So things weren't going all that well. And uh, Greece continued, Athens especially, continued to decline. And then, uh, of course, we have the rise of the Roman Empire. Well, first off, the conquest of Alexander the Great. Uh, and then the rise of the Roman Empire and the, and, uh, the Greek city-states basically at this point become Roman colonies. Um, however, the Romans idolized the Greeks and really culturally wanted to be as Greek as possible, so Greek learning was still the standard. But in this uh, turmoil, one of the things that happens, and this happens quite often in world history, it happened round about the same time in India, in fact, uh, resulting in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, one of their great scriptures. Uh, one of the things that happens uh, during this time period is because of the social unrest, many of the young people that normally would go into uh, politics and into the political scene uh, decide to kind of opt out. If they've got enough money and they've got enough education, they might just decide not to go into the active life and instead retreat to a philosophical school. So this has the result of philosophy becoming not a pastime uh, for gentlemen, nor becoming sort of a finishing school for somebody who is going to go into the political life, but in fact something that uh, one would do with their entire life. One would be a philosopher all their life. Uh, and this was really not the point of the, of the earlier uh, philosophical schools. They were training schools. They weren't, uh, you know, they weren't uh, monasteries. Uh, and uh, so we have this shift to philosophy, as uh, Pierre Hadot calls it, H-A-D-O-T, uh, philosophy is a way of life. And that brings me to the next topic, that there, there is a required reading that goes along with this uh, section, and it is by Pierre Hadot, H-A-D-O-T, and it's called Spiritual Exercises, and you will find that in the required reading. Um, so, this period starts with the death of Aristotle and Alexander and continues uh, until, really, Christianity becomes the only player in town. Um, prior to 380, there was actually quite a lot of competition between various schools of philosophy, uh, between Christian theologians, Jewish theologians, there were uh, between Gnostic ideas, there were an awful lot of different, in fact, I often say that the early Hellenistic period was the single most diverse time period uh, or culture uh, 
uh, in world history prior to our own. The single most diverse culture all around the Mediterranean uh, in terms of different religions, different languages, uh, different philosophies, different sciences, different, you name it, it's, uh, just uh, an incredible uh, richness to this period. Uh, and final thing, uh, this period has really been slow to be studied uh, for a variety of reasons by scholars, um, but now there is a, an ex, a, a huge body of excellent material coming out uh, looking at the influence of Egypt on Greece, uh, looking at the you know rise of science along with you know the the influence of religion, uh, including things like uh, religious ritual, things like theurgy, uh, which you don't need to know the word; it means ritual magic, um, all kinds of things that haven't been looked at before. So uh, this is really one of the more exciting and interesting areas uh, of scholarship today. And it really was kicked off by Pierre Hadot back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s uh, with his writings, uh, particularly on the Stoics and the Epicureans, and showing that their philosophy consisted not just of a set of theories, but of a way of life. And that's what we'll, we'll discuss. Well, we already know that the uh, translation of philosophy, the word philosophy, philos, sophos, comes out to the love of wisdom, and we've talked about uh, somewhat about uh, how odd wisdom is as a virtue, a virtue that no one will claim for themselves, because that would seem terribly arrogant, uh, and which has some peculiar characteristics. Uh, Hado begins uh, by pointing out that for the Greeks, wisdom is not just a matter of acquisition of knowledge, but always included an element of transformation, the transformation of human nature. Um, and the in earlier Greek philosophy, the role of philosophy was to prepare people uh, for the political life by making them into good, conscious citizens. Um, in the Hellenistic period, as I just mentioned, the... Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, people who would have normally gone into politics now take up philosophy as a way of life. So they are pursuing transformation. They're pursuing wisdom their whole life. Um, so wisdom becomes defined uh, as something sought for in itself, not just something that one uh, would, would use in service to the state. but what characterizes wisdom. So here are some of the virtues associated with wisdom according to the Stoics and Epicureans in particular. First off, ataraxia. And by the way, you don't need to ever know any of the Greek words except for a couple like aporia, you should know that one. But uh, ataraxia, atarchia, parisia, you don't need to know these Greek words. But these characteristics are important. Peace of mind or uh, freedom from anguish. Um, as you see here, it says even the study of nature is for this goal. And that's because we can't have peace of mind if we don't uh, know our place in nature. If we don't know where we belong in the cosmos, then uh, we will forever be unhappy. Uh, we won't fit, as it were. And so even physics, the study of nature, is for this goal to find our place in nature. Uh, inner freedom, autarky is basically the same word as autonomy. It means uh, self-rule, um, and the quotes here are from Hado, uh, the, the uh, state in which the ego depends only upon itself and the ability of the human self to distance itself from everything which is alien to it. Uh, and again, this comes back to one of the basic practices of the Stoics and Epicureans is not to put meanings on events, but let the events be the events that they are because you can't change them anyway. Uh, uh, try not to put a meaning on them, but if, a, if you do have to attach a meaning to an event, then don't attach an emotion to that meaning. 
So for example, if some, the event could be somebody cuts you off in traffic. That is an event that essentially has no meaning until you interpret it as he intentionally cut me off or that person intentionally cut me off. And then along with that, uh, if you associate the emotion of anger, then of course you maybe gesticulate and uh, say something and you have you know gotten angry. So that event has that that event uh, that you have experienced has linked itself to an emotion so that every time a similar event comes up, that emotion will also be called up. And that's really the definition of a passion, a habitual emotion, really. So um, if we're not going to be now, the result of that is that any event happens has certain emotions linked to them. And therefore, we're on a roller coaster ride of emotions. And we can never be happy. We can never maintain our center, our focus on ourself. We can never be at peace. And we're really not running ourselves. Events are running us. So the goal is to separate the sensory image uh, from the meaning and from the emotion and the passion uh, created by the meaning. It, the, if we achieve this, we might also achieve paresia which is more than speaking truth to power, though that's how it's usually translated. Paresia is really being oneself in all circumstances. You know, you can imagine uh, how you might act if a publisher's clearinghouse brought that, you know, huge check to your house, million dollar check. Would you, you know, just completely lose your mind and jump up and down and completely lose it? Um, or, or would you just remain yourself? How would you act if you met, you know, one, the one celebrity whom you most admire? You're going to just completely just mumble and not be able to talk to them or be yourself. Jacob Needleman, in his book, The Heart of Philosophy, a book I really recommend to you, um, uh, talks about, and by the way, jacobneedleman.com. He's, he's a living American philosopher, very, very interesting guy, jacobneedleman.com. Anyway, uh, in that book, it, it talks about his 40 years of teaching philosophy to uh, undergrads and to high school students. Now, high school students, under like, un unlike most college students, uh, go home to their fam families at the end of the day, and mom and dad might say, what did you learn at school today? And the kid might say, well, Dr. Needleman taught us that we're like prisoners trapped in the bottom of a cave. And the parents say, we need to see, meet, meet with this professor. And so they had a, a meeting, and it was the 1970s, so it's a cocktail party at somebody's suburban home, and people standing around, you know, with maybe a cocktail in one hand and a cigarette in the other, just schmoozing, you know, and everybody, men dressed in suits and ties and women in party dresses and the whole thing. And Needleman describes the scene, and he says, you know, the, uh, uh, he remembers uh, talking to the father of one of his students who was a lawyer, and, you know, trying to keep up with the conver his end of the conversation by, you know, citing things from about the local, you know, court case that was all in the newspapers, trying to sound knowledgeable and hip and everything. And then later he's talking to the uh, mother of one of his students who's a very attractive woman. He's kind of flirting with her. And he just describes this scene where every person he talks to, it's as if he puts on a different mask. He's never himself. He's just putting on these different social masks to try to impress all these different people. Well, not coincidentally, the Latin word for mask is persona. Now, that means, of course, persona in English, of course, means a kind of a mask. It means an assumed, uh, uh, an assumed character. Uh, but it is also where we get the word person. So it raises the question, is a person just a series of social masks? Or is there some, you know, essential self that we need to get to? The Stoics and the Epicureans thought there was an essential self uh, and that it, we could learn uh, to remain true to that, you know, to that central self. And perhaps if we do, we could achieve a state which Hado refer, for, refers to as universalization, a kind of a cumbersome term. Uh, another term that's been used for it is cosmic consciousness. There is no accepted nomenclature, no accepted term for this. 
uh, but it really has to do with if one realizes one's true self, to some degree one realizes also that, uh, that all selves are the same true self or that there is some spiritual unity at the very least between all of these selves. Um, and uh, Hado, in fact, describes a practice uh, of imagining oneself floating above the earth to imagine one's unity with all things you can read about in the spiritual uh, exercises article. Well, it's certainly much more, much easier to say what philosophy as practice isn't, uh, rather than to say what it is, as we will see. Uh, but certainly, uh, we can say that philosophical praxis, which is the Greek word for practice, is not just knowledge about philosophical practices, or mere mastery of a technique, or just the study of philosophy. At the same time, I think that Hado often made the mistake of distinguishing too much between philosophy as theory or discourse on the one hand and philosophy as practice on the other hand. After all, you can't do philosophy as practice at all unless it involves some theory. And I would say certainly most uh, philosophers always, uh, and even today, most philosophers, including myself, are theory wonks. We like theory all kinds of theory. The more theory, the better. Uh, but that, that theory isn't, you know, opposed to doing uh, philosophy. That theory or discourse isn't just preparing to do philosophy, but is part of philosophy. So I think Hado over overdrives that uh, distinction a bit much, uh, but certainly uh, really to do philosophy in the fullest sense uh, is something more than just knowing about it or mastering a technique. But as I said, to know what ph philosophy as practice is, uh, is a harder thing to say since it's about transformation, and tra that transformation is ongoing. So uh, it might be better to use the uh, metaphor of a journey. Uh, we have a quote from Michel Foucault here, who, uh, late in his life, got interested in Hellenistic philosophy and left behind a set of lectures at the Collège de France uh, on Hellenistic philosophy, which are brilliant and very readable. Uh, but his point here, he says, uh, philo philosophical practice is both uh, theoretical and practical knowledge, as well as being conjectural knowledge, uh, and is very close, of course, to the knowledge of piloting. Um, so like a journey, I mean, we're trying to find our way to the home port. We're uh, trying, therefore, trying to, we're using the navigational guides that we have. Um, we might not know exactly where the destination is, but we know the direction. That kind of, uh, of course, journey metaphors and aphorisms about journeys are, uh, you know, there are thousands of them. Uh, perhaps philosophical practice is like an initiation. Here uh, I'm going to be uh, mentioning the three categories that uh, Victor Turner gives us in his article, Betwixt and Between, which are on rites of passage. Um, here you have two images of rites of passage in the top one. These young boys are, are going to go through an initiation process to bring them to manhood uh, so they can be, you know, uh, full members in their society. And uh, at the bottom, you have some young men who are dedicating themselves to a monastery and uh, who will go through a symbolic practice. Uh, this is it, what you see pictured here, in fact, is a symbolic ritual, or I should say a ritual symbolizing uh, death and resurrection. When they stand up, they will have new names, they will have left the world behind them, they will become mem members of the monastery. Uh, Victor Turner said that initiations have three stages. The first stage is separation. Uh, the initiate has to be separated from their former way of life. He uses a, an African tribe uh, as an example. He says uh, some boys, perhaps like these pictured here, uh, would be essentially kidnapped from their homes in the middle of the night. Uh, of course, there would be a lot of crying and wailing and, and all of that kind of stuff. 
they would be taken out into the boonies where they would be um, where they would live in a camp together uh, and they would be trained in all the things they need to know they need to know how to hunt they need to know how to to raise crops they need to know how to follow herds they need to know the birds and the bees they need to know uh, how to negotiate with other tribes they need to know all the things a man needs to know so uh, the separation stage is you know separating from the old way of life and then this stage where they're in a camp together uh, Turner calls this the liminal stage an odd word based on the Latin word uh, for doorway so this is the doorway stage. Liminal is L-I-M-I-N-A-L. Uh, so it's the doorway stage. It's the training stage where they aren't what they used to be. They're not kids anymore, but they're not full adults yet either. They're in that betwixt, bit, betwixt and between stage. Um, and he points out that there are several interesting characteristics of that stage. For example, uh, it doesn't matter at that stage if one kid is the son of a shoeman uh, a, a shoemaker, sorry, and the other is the son of the king. Uh, during the liminal stage, they're all equal. Their personal identities have to be stripped down, and they have to uh, be given new identities and new ways of relating to one another. So that's part of the liminal stage. And once the training is all done and they're ready to become full members of society, uh, the third stage is uh, reintegration. Uh, and this occurs with a probably a ceremony of some kind where they're recognized as full adults with full adult rights and responsibilities. So how is philosophy like that? Well, back in the day, uh, in Hellenistic times, uh, many of the philosophical schools had actual initiation processes. The philosopher was a wise man, or at least uh, some version of a kind of enlightened elder or something, and uh, a master, let's say, and uh, the students were more like disciples. Everybody probably dressed the same. They may live together. They may have a similar diet, kind of like Pythagoras's cult that we talked about earlier. That was still very much a custom. Uh, is philosophy like an initiation today? Uh, maybe in some ways, college is still somewhat initiatory. You go from not having a college education uh, at least if you're a traditional student, uh, you know, college is sort of the rite of passage to adulthood uh, or to an adult career or something like that. Uh, we do have other initiatory types of uh, institutions and, and rituals in American society, such as boot camp, uh, such as initiation into a gang of any kind, such as maybe the, the uh, Greeks on campus, the, the uh, fraternities and sororities. Uh, I mentioned college itself, so uh, also in religious institutions, the bar or bat mitzvah in Judaism, the uh, quinceanera in the Mexican Catholic tradition, the um, uh, uh, and uh, baptism, confirmation, uh, chrismation in, uh, the, in many Christian traditions. So these initiation processes still exist. Um, philosophy as an academic uh, study doesn't really adhere to the idea of philosophy as initiation, but there are people like Pierre Hadot uh, who would like to bring that element back uh, in some way. So, well, we'll see. Uh, conversion, we'll talk about a little in a, a few minutes, and death and rebirth we'll also talk about in just a few. Socrates himself gave us uh, some other metaphors for philosophy and the philosopher. I thought we'd look at while we uh, are, were on the topic. Uh, his, probably his most <clears throat> excuse me, famous example or metaphor was the gadfly. Um, most of us nowadays don't know what a gadfly is, so just think of a horsefly. Horseflies, of course, they buzz around and they bite until they draw blood. And uh, they're incredibly annoying uh, like this little gadfly here, uh, I wake up every morning thinking I feel a desperate need to be irritating. Um, so, you know, the philosopher metaphorically is the person who goes around picking on people's opinions until he draws blood. The midwife uh, metaphor is that uh, everybody is sort of pregnant with the truth, uh, but may not be able to birth the truth without the help of the midwife. So the philosopher is like the midwife who helps people birth the truth, 
And the other part of that metaphor is uh, that there is pain involved. There's pain involved in coming to the truth and, and leaving behind cherished beliefs that one might find are not as true as one thought. Uh, death and rebirth, philosophy is a daily dying, a training for death, as Socrates said. We'll talk more about death and rebirth in just a few minutes. The physician uh, metaphor that the philosopher is the good physician who can diagnose people's various spiritual illnesses and prescribe the correct medicine. Uh, also, that the healing process, uh, again, includes some pain. Um, you know, if a bone is broken, it has to be set. If uh, you have to take some medicine, it might be bitter. Uh, and so the implication, again, that philosophy is not always pleasant. The truth is not always, as Nietzsche points out, the truth is not always uh, what pleases us, nor is uh, the false what is necessarily evil. Uh, the rational farmer idea is that the Philosopher is like uh, uh, a farmer who has the seeds of truth and knows how to plant them in the appropriate souls, uh, which suggests an idea of discernment, that the philosopher can read other people's uh, states of being and provide for them the medicine that they need. I think it's interesting that in the Christian New Testament, uh, Jesus, one of Jesus' parables, uh, the parable of the sower, is somewhat similar. There, the idea is that some of the seed falls on the path and is trodden underfoot and doesn't grow. Some of the seed falls on uh, uh, rocky soil and it springs up for a little while and then withers quickly. Some of the seed falls on fertile earth and grows abundantly. The, and this being likened to the different types of human hearts. The, uh, some hearts are so hard that they won't grow anything. Some hearts are, uh, you know, initially receptive, but then, uh, you know, uh, get distracted or basically just aren't aren't fertile. They don't ultimately won't grow uh, things well. And then some hearts are soft and fertile and ready to be open to the truth. So it's interesting that uh, Socrates and Jesus would. Uh, you know, uh, come up with such uh, similar metaphors in some ways. I also, uh, by the way, I have posted here the dialogues uh, where you can find these metaphors and the page numbers, which are marginal page numbers. And I, I hope I mentioned this before, that in this text and in Descartes, there are these marginal page numbers that are the same in every edition. No matter what edition you have, if you have the marginal page numbers, they'll be the same, whereas the modern page number might be different. So anyway, uh, we'll be talking more about that when we assign the paper. One of the characteristics of uh, Hellenistic philosophy is that it, it doesn't tend to be presented uh, in a recognizably systematic way. That is, in a, in a logical or essay form or, um, you know, mathematical type of uh, system, we don't find this in the Hellenistic period. Instead, we find dialogues, poems, uh, hymns, uh, aphorisms, collections of aphorisms, parables, fables, myths. Uh, of course, Plato himself wrote in dialogue. Part of the reason for this is that these are uh, these writings are intended for people who are in different places in their spiritual progress. Uh, some are beginners, some are intermediate, some are advanced, and so you, you wouldn't want to give the same teaching to everybody. Uh, therefore, the text is presented in such a way that when a person reads it, they have to engage the text. Uh, through discernment. In other words, they have to figure out what in the text applies to them at their stage. And that requires that they are honest with themselves and that they have, uh, you know, exercised uh, examination of the self, that they have examined their, their self and that they know where they're at spiritually and, and they can recognize what they need and they can utilize discernment. Um, so the you know these texts are extremely adaptable. Another way to talk about them is to use uh, Kierkegaard's phrase. Kierkegaard, the 19th century Danish uh, theologian and philo existential philosopher, uh, 
came up with the, the, the term uh, indirect communication. Uh, Hellenistic philosophy is characterized by uh, indirect communication. That is, these uh, direct communication, which I'm doing badly now because it's late at night, uh, but direct communication is to try to just uh, impart information to somebody so they should be able to uh, say it back to you just the same way you said it to them. That would be direct, uh, good, successful, direct communication. Indirect communication is a type of communication uh, that really takes the author out of the picture and really puts the text together with the reader and, and requires the reader to come up with the meaning, to find the meaning for themselves. And so uh, kind of a particip participatory type of reading. So these can be, you know, as I said, collections of aphorisms. Uh, the Apophthegmata, the collections of aphorisms in particular uh, in early Christian monastic writing, the sayings of the desert fathers, uh, the early monks uh, and their stories. These are uh, um, amazing uh, tales uh, that almost always have a spiritual point. Uh, Hyponemata aids to memory. Again, you don't need to know the Greek um, but just you know, different kinds of of ways of uh, using texts. One of my favorite is the Flora Legium, the bouquet of words. Basically, take a notebook with you wherever you go, and when you hear an aphorism, hear a saying, hear something that touches you, uh, is interesting to you, you just jot it down and keep that. Uh, essentially, that's what Marcus Aurelius's meditations were. Uh, just his little book of his little bouquet of teachings that he used um, in particular. It, you know, these are uh, very useful in times of struggle and trial and suffering. One can look back at these bouquets of words and get consolation. Lectio Divina was a medieval type of meditative reading used in the monastery. Um, you know, uh, essentially when you're reading a good text, occasionally you come across an idea that, you know, blows your mind, that really, uh, really stops you. And Lectio Divina would uh, indicate that what you should do at that point is just stop and rest with the idea meditatively. Just let it stay in your mind and let it affect you for a few minutes. So this kind of slowing down, meditating, uh, internalizing texts, that's all part of indirect communication as well. Hellenistic paideia, or education, was a continuation of uh, Plato's ideas of paideia, and we discussed Platonic paideia in terms of gymnastics, music, mathematics, the, uh, logic, dialectic. Um, at this time, it would be it, it is very easy to see in Plato's writings already the three stages of formation listed here: purification, uh, which are uh, practices that uh, help us to get over our bad habits, to cut off uh, appetites, emotions, passions, and monkey mind, uh, to start to separate events from meanings from emotions so that we don't uh, start attaching emotions to events and uh, wind up on the roller coaster of emotions. All those purificatory practices, including ascetic practices, bodily practices for spiritual goals, um, the practice of the virtues and other practices. Illumination uh, signifies enlightenment, uh, getting out of the cave, as it were. Uh, practices there um, get very strange, and I won't go into them here. Uh, perfection practices are even stranger um, and really hard to talk about because they're not really talked about in the texts. Again, the texts are uh, primarily practical texts for people in different points along the scale of uh, spiritual progress. Um, and if you were at the level of illumination or perfection, you would no doubt be working with a, a, some kind of elder or uh, some kind of master or uh, some kind of wise man. And they would impart uh, the teachings directly to you. It wouldn't be something that would normally be written down for most people. There are indications in the text but, uh, you know, in, in deference to the texts themselves, I'm not going to talk about them here. Um, if anybody's interested, you can always email me. Um, 
along with these stages of formation, there, uh, the Platonists came up with an order for reading the Platonic texts. And uh, you can find that order uh, in another book by Pierre Hadot called The Veil of Isis, which is on the concept or concepts throughout history of nature. Nature has gone through a number of different interpretations at different times, and that's what this book is about. Fascinating book. Uh, and you can see how the Platonists laid out Plato's texts according to texts that were for beginners, texts that were for intermediate, and texts that were for advanced students. Um, I've always thought it would be very interesting to go through and read the dialogues in that order to see what effect it would have. Um, one of the mo important points here is that, uh, on the one hand, uh, spiritual progress or philosophical progress here uh, happens at the level of knowledge. We saw this in Plato's cave, that the prisoners are ignorant uh, and the escaped prisoner has turned to knowledge. But that also uh, the, there is implied in Plato's cave allegory the idea that righteousness is also necessary. In other words, morality, uh, transforming oneself not only in terms of one's knowledge, but also in becoming a good person, developing a good character, transforming oneself morally. Um, and uh, that is also true in Hellenistic philosophy, that there was both a, a, a level of discourse or theory and a level of practices to put that theory in uh, into practice and also into transformations. Uh, Buddhism talks about view and practice in much the same way. You explore the view and when the view makes sense you put it into practice and the practice then confirms the truth of the view. Uh, this would also be embodied in a master-disciple relationship in the Hellenistic schools uh, and the master was usually uh, some perhaps not a wise man in the fullest ideal sense, but at least had that kind of authority, charismatic authority, we might say spiritual authority. So here are some of the, uh, the spiritual practices, as, as Hado calls them. Uh, Foucault points out that the Greek term for these would be ethopoeian, uh, a, a making of one's individual self, one's way of being. Um, now, all these practices can be done for other reasons, but when they're done for philosophical goals, for the sake of becoming who we are, then they're philosophical practices. Uh, so we'll uh, look at these a little bit individually, but... Uh, um, for example, apatheia there, uh, we should say apatheia is where we get the word apathy, but it, what it means is control of the passions. Uh, there was a long-standing debate uh, from pagan times right on through Christian times about whether uh, it is possible to become completely passionless, passionless uh, or if the goal was only control of the passions. Um, some philosophers like Seneca, the Stoic, Roman Stoic philosopher, argued that you weren't really a philosopher until you had eliminated the passions. But the majority position seems to be that it's not possible to get rid of the passions because that would make us less than fully human, but that what we need to do is put the passions under the control of the noose of the higher mind. Uh, we'll talk about all of these uh, topics Of course, Socratic dialectic is probably the most famous example of one of these techniques of uh, reading, writing, and listening. Uh, and um, but there were many others, and there are many for, were and are many forms of dialectic itself. Again, dialectic just means essentially the same as dialogue, um, and so that can be used in many ways, in philosophical ways. Uh, Aristotle, even Aristotle, though he is not really considered. A, therape a therapeutic philosopher like Plato or the Stoics or the Epicureans, even Aristotle's writings are based on this give and take with students. Aristotle typically takes a topic, asks for opinions about it, and then, you know, analyzes the opinions. 
so there's this engagement with people's everyday opinion and trying to clarify, start there and try to clarify those opinions uh, until they are, uh, you know, either shown to be false or, you know, they won't work or uh, they're shown to be true. Mnemonics is uh, the various practices of uh, memorization. The Greeks were masters of this, uh, probably because they were a mostly pre-literate society. Keep in mind that, you know, in ancient times and really in medieval times too, though there were literate people and there were books being made, this was a very small minority of the people. So the society as a whole was pre-literate and the main way of getting information and hearing, you know, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey was that somebody had memorized them and was able to perform them. Letter writing right up into the 20th century was one of the main ways in which cultured people, going back to ancient times, cultured people maintained relationships with other people. And, uh, you know, we've, we call letter writing correspondence because we are, we are co-responding to uh, someone. And this was also used in ancient times as a sort of stand-in for the master-disciple relationship. And, uh, you know, some of the for elements of formal letter writing that we still have, saying, dear such and such at the beginning of a letter, or sincerely at the end of a letter, are, you know, sort of distant echoes of the way that letter writing used to be used to embody a a, a master-disciple relationship when the master and the disciple couldn't be in the same place at the same time. So letter writing has been culturally hugely important and um, unfortunately it seems like it might be on its way out now because of texting and email. Arguably the key practice of Hellenistic philosophy is self-examination. But that requires first that we're not distracted by our senses uh, and, uh, you know, end endlessly distracted by worldly events. And so the first step that many of the philosophical schools talk about is the turn to the self, uh, the conversion of a gaze, as St. Augustine called it. St. Augustine himself, a uh, Hellenistic Greek of the 4th century, uh, living in the western part of the empire in North Africa and, and Italy. Uh, the Latin word for uh, this, of course, is conversion, for conversion is convertere. Uh, the Greek is, I think, typically much a much richer term, to change one's noose, to really change one's fundamental being. And this raises a question that is a question, meaning that, uh, uh, you know, I am not going to tell you what I think the answer is, um, and that I hope that you will hold it in your mind as a question and perhaps come back to it. Uh, because I think it's a question that bears thinking about over a long period of time, maybe all over the course of one's whole life. And that is the question, to what degree can human beings be changed? To what degree are they transformable? Can human nature be changed? Some people would say, that human nature is essentially fixed. We are, after all, the same person at birth than we are at death. There is no essential change. Other people would say, well, yeah, there, you know, there's got to be some change. There's at the least the change of habits, for example. One gets habits, one loses habits. Uh, there's the change of, of thought processes. That can even sometimes be quite profound. You see people really radically changing their political or religious or other kinds of ideas. Uh, so that's a pretty profound change. Uh, but, you know, the idea that uh, human nature can be changed day and night, um, some people would resist that idea. But it seems to me that in the Hellenistic tradition, as, and, and this also would go for uh, rabbinic Judaism, uh, as well as uh, Christian monastic theology, that human nature is considered to be essentially transformable. That is, it can be transformed in essence. One can, as the as uh, Christian scripture says, one can put off the old man and put on the new man, and that it, it is really a radically different person that comes out of that process. 
So that's an open question, though. I don't know the, uh, I mean, I know what the texts say to some extent, but uh, exactly what the answer is, I leave as an open question for you. Um, this points us back in the direction of this question of philosophy as a preparation for being a citizen or philosophy being a lifelong pursuit, that one is a philosopher one's whole life long. Uh, and as I said, in the Hellenistic period, with the social and political situation being uh, so tumultuous, you know, a lot of people took to philosophy as not a lot. It's never been a lot, but uh, more people took to uh, philosophy as a lifelong pursuit. And this raises the next, uh, a, a kind of more fundamental question, what's the relationship between these practices of transformation, between philosophy as, you know, as pra practices of transformation and social action and changing society. Some people would say that, uh, you know, if we don't transform ourselves first and we try to transform society, then we'll just uh, make society more selfish and more, well, we'll basically just infect society with the, uh, with the problems that we have. So if we're going to change society, we need to transform ourselves first. Other people will say, on the contrary, social action itself can be transformative. It won't only change society, it will change us. The, that process can be a sort of spiritual exercise itself. Um, I don't think the Greeks were of one mind about this at all, and uh, I wouldn't say that Christianity or Judaism are either that both uh, or all of these positions have been uh, part of, of these various traditions. A few more words on self-examination. Uh, the Greeks point out how strange a practice self-examination is because unlike other forms of examination, this is a type of examination that one does to oneself. In most forms of examination, somebody is, I mean, if I could set you an exam, right? I could say, here, you're going to take this exam. Or you go to the doctor and the doctor examines you. But in this case, the person doing the examining is the person being examined. So that's strange. Second, what is the self? What is the nature of the self? Where is it? How does one focus on it? You don't focus on it the way you do a book, exactly, um, though there is some similarity between the two to activities. Um, another thing is, what is the goal of such examination? If I set you an examination, the goal is to get a good grade or to learn something. Uh, in the case of self-examination, the goal is illumination or enlightenment. That is, to come to an awareness of the nature of one's own mind and the nature of reality. That's the definition of enlightenment. Um, also, what makes this odd is that the higher self, the noose, isn't an object of knowledge. Like, uh, you know, a thought could be an object of knowledge. I, let's say I could have a thought of a lamp. I'm looking at a lamp. And so I could look at that thought and I could analyze that thought. I could say what kind of lamp it is, etc., etc. But the highest self is not a, a thing in that same sense. Uh, it is, first off, invisible. It is, you know, perhaps has the nature of light itself, uh, but exactly how you would, you know, you can't take it as an object. You can't describe it. It is ineffable. It can't be spoken. Uh, it has to be experienced. Um, so those kinds of characteristics make this practice extremely difficult. And while Socrates is our guide and, and model in this process, we don't want to become Socrates. We want to become ourself. Well, how can we become ourself unless we're ourself already? This is the paradox. According to the example of Socrates, we see that Plato, Socrates, and much of the Greek tradition believed that the self was transformable. Uh, it was, in essence, transformational in some way. Um, Therefore, there was a reluctance toward, toward, but a general acceptance of ambiguity, difference, otherness, lack of closure. Uh, this always reminds me that 
Um, as I may have told you before, I had a teacher who was a piano teacher who was, uh, before he retired to become a piano teacher, he was, in cor he was a corporate psychologist. And he said that um, in his experience uh, working with, you know, doing therapy with bankers, essentially, he said what he recognized as the uh, sign of mental health, the one sure sign of mental health, he said, was tolerance for ambiguity, tolerance for gray area, not needing to control everything down to the finest detail, not needing to have everything uh, in their little boxes, not needing to have everything black and white, but allowing that, you know, there's gray area. Most of life is gray area, as the cliche goes. So, um, I, you know, I think that's very much in line with this Hellenistic idea. And therefore, you know, we don't just find meaning in theory, but in poetry and myth and dialectic and parable and all kinds and aphorisms, as we'll get to in a few minutes. So, uh, interestingly, even though the Greek schools did not necessarily agree with one another about what the goal was, they all sort they all sort of agreed that the goal was the wise man, but they didn't agree if there even was a wise man. But they did agree that if there was a wise man, it was Socrates. And they all did respect the authority of Plato's writings. Uh, Aristotle, for example, did not have that kind of authority at all. They, most, most of the ancient Greeks thought of Aristotle as Plato's student. So uh, this ideal of the wise man, you know, the question is, is there even anybody who is, has achieved it, who has lived it out? Uh, and if so, very few, and perhaps only one. Perhaps Socrates is the only one that, uh, according to the Greeks. As I mentioned before, apatheia doesn't mean apathy, but control or restraint of the senses. Um, first off, you know, eliminating curiosity by controlling the senses, by not looking at just anything, not, uh, you know, giving in to uh, sensory impulses uh, that might stir up appetites and such. Um, again, as with the passions, the goal is probably not to kill off the appetites, because then one would die of starvation, for example, but uh, to control the emotions, passions, and thoughts. Uh, you know, not only would you not want to kill off the, emo the appetites, um, you know, you don't want to kill off the emotions. You'd be less than human if you did that as well. And you don't want to kill, it's probably also impossible to kill off the thoughts, though it is possible to hold the thoughts still for a while. Uh, you know, brain produces monkey mind, so uh, it's probably not possible to get rid of monkey mind entirely, but it is possible to quiet it down to the point where the higher mind uh, can get a, you know, can get a word in edgewise, as it were. Uh, and Again, this process comes back to, uh, you know, uh, achieving apatheia comes back to separation of the sensory image from a meaning given to the sensory image and uh, the emotion, emotions or passions uh, that, that are also attached to it. So uh, the danger comes when we attach a sensory image to an emotion habitually, time after time, uh, and that becomes a passion then it becomes very difficult to separate sensory image, meaning, and emotion. So we need, the Hellenistic philosophers thought, training of the thoughts, emotions, and passions. Uh, this would include uh, ascetic practices like uh, uh, restricting diet, uh, moral purification, restricting sleep, restricting sex, uh, and also controlling and cutting off the thoughts through meditative practices, cutting off the passions and appetites through starving them, um, and things like that. So there was a, a therapeutic, a system of practices, of therapeutic practices for achieving apatheia. How to, the practice of the virtues uh, consists of how to build virtues and how to overcome vices. And the Hellenistic philosophers believe that virtues and vices uh, are, uh, well, virtues are linked to one another in a chain and vices are linked to other vices in a chain. And, that, and so sometimes you will see in, in the Hellenistic writings 
uh, just a you know uh, uh, hu you know something like humility leads to selflessness, selflessness leads to obedience, obedience leads to, and it's just a you know a linkage of uh, various virtues with one another. Um, now, all sorts should be said. There are different kinds of virtues, and uh, there are external virtues such as wealth and health and big family and uh, education and things like that. There are civic virtues such as willingness to compromise, honesty, punctuality, etc. And there are internal virtues like piety, uh, uh, excellence, arete, and other internal virtues. Um, the Hellenistic philosophers also broke down the sequence uh, through which a passion is formed. First, there's a proclivity, that means a tendency uh, toward a particular uh, action or emotion. Uh, and really what they're talking about here is, again, where we link an event to a meaning and to an emotion. And that produces a proclivity for a particular passion. The passion then leads to a chronic state and perhaps a permanent condition of vice. So this kind of uh, linkage suggests that, you know, first there is a sensory stimulus. That's the first thing, a sensory stimulus. Let's say you're supposed to be fasting because you're part of the Pythagorean cult. You're not supposed to eat meat. And you pass by a McDonald's and you smell the beautiful fragrance of McDonald's uh, meat, let's call it. Uh, cooking. Okay, so that would create a sensory image, in this case a smell. But that's all there is. That's the, all there is is the event of a, of, a, of a scent. But then, if that stirs up an appetite, then one puts a meaning on it. Oh, that smells good, or that smells like, you know, that McDonald's hamburger smells good. You put a meaning on the event. If then you also put an emotion on the event, I really hate this fasting, it really is no fun, I really wish I could have a hamburger, then one, one is on the road to actually uh, a passion. And so that's the, those, those linkages have to be undone for one to uh, overcome a, a vice and to put on a virtue. And the way to do that is don't attack all of the passions at once, but deal with one's dominant passion first. So if one is, for example, a glutton, uh, that then, then smelling the McDonald's hamburger would be a much worse per problem than it would be for a person who doesn't have uh, tendencies toward gluttony. So those are the kinds of, you know, sort of psychological uh, evaluations of uh, vices and virtues done by the Hellenistic philosophers. And I think can be very helpful today. Meditation just means focused thinking, holding something in the mind without really trying to do anything with it, but allow it to appear before your mind. And so this can be done on any of the things we've been talking about, aphorisms, parables, fables, etc. It could uh, be meditation on the cosmos, in which case you'd ha again have Hado's idea of theological physics, the idea of trying to discover the plan or the meaning of, uh, of reality. Uh, another word for the meaning of reality is providence, that there is a plan, that there uh, is a place for human beings and me as an individual, and I need to know what that is or I, won't, I will never be happy. So this meditation on the cosmos. Uh, probably most characteristic of the Stoics and the Epicureans was the idea of uh, meditating on the future. Meditatio malorum means meditation on future evils. So again, you're trying to prepare yourself because Evil and suffering will happen. Evil, suffering, and death are going to happen to everybody, inevitably, by virtue of being human. And if we're prepared for them, then we won't be knocked off our center. We'll be able to maintain ourselves through all of those events. Future blessings uh, are even worse for our, our equilibrium, because then we get attached to the fruits of those things, because they're, they're enjoyable. And we want more of them, and we want more of them, and we want the blessings to continue and we become attached, and, uh, and therefore we suffer uh, disappointment when we don't get the blessing. And we'll talk a little bit more about meditation on death here in just a second.
The meditation on death is not intended to be morbid, but it certainly isn't easy. Uh, Epictetus here uh, from his handbook. By the way, Epictetus' two great books, I recommend them both to you. Uh, one is called The Discourses, and it's the bigger book. And then this book that I have listed here, The Enchiridion, or Handbook, uh, it is just a 20-page, uh, almost a pamphlet, but it summarizes Epictetus' philosophy. I highly recommend both of them. Uh, let death and exile and all other things which appear terrible be daily before your eyes, but death chiefly, and you'll never under entertain an abject thought nor too eagerly co covet anything. I think it's easy to see why, if we meditated on death, we wouldn't eagerly covet anything, because at death we can't take it with us. So if you realize that and you really accept that at death our, all of our possessions are left behind, we would never um, uh, covet anything but inter never entertain an abject thought. I guess the idea here is that if we have control over ourselves and we realize and we stay in the moment and we're not, f we're not dwelling on the future, uh, that we will be better able to maintain our uh, ataraxia, our freedom from anxiety. Uh, Hado puts a different spin on it, says that it's training for death is to die to individuality and passions and look at things from a broader perspective. I mean, after all, we are all going to die and realize that we're all in the same boat with other people and that ultimately, spiritually, we really are the same as other people in this respect. A uh, wonderful painting by El Greco shows St. Francis uh, kneeling before, of course, a crucifix, but also what is known as a memento mori, a reminder of death a human skull, an ancient custom of having a human skull on one's desk. Now, human skulls are obviously hard to come by unless you want to go to a medical supply place and get one. Uh, so what I recommend is going to a uh, something like a uh, Mexican day of, store that has Day of the Dead things, and they will have ceramic uh, uh, skulls of various sizes, and some of them were really cool designs, so that's kind of a nice way to get your memento mori. Well, yes, I guess in a way this is a gag slide, but the point is attentiveness is really the one of the main practices and one of the main goals of Hellenistic philosophy, and it brings up a point about this literature that sometimes a word like attentiveness can mean a set of practices such as meditation, staying in the moment, etc. So it can uh, attentiveness can refer to those practices, but attentiveness can also refer to the goal of those practices. That is a state of attentiveness in which one is always aware of the self, no matter what else is going on. So. Uh, attentiveness is an example of this structure. Um, it's, it's really it's referred to as the scopos, the sort of scope of the practice. All of the practices that lead up to the goal, uh, all uh, you know, all referred to by uh, the same word. So it's kind of confusing. But what does attentiveness mean? It means living in the present. We're very often thinking about the past, holding on to stuff from the past. Could even be the distant past, childhood, things, you know, especially when we're tired and the mind just dwells on things from the past, especially negative things. And we can hold on uh, to things for so long. Somebody cuts us off in traffic and we hold on to that anger and we think back on it and that burn of anger starts in again. It's a classic story from the sayings of the Desert Fathers about two monks who were walking along the road and they came to a river that they could they could wade across and they didn't mind getting wet so they just waded across but on the other side was a beautiful woman in a beautiful dress and she was distressed because she didn't know how to cross the river without getting her dress messed up so without thinking one of the uh, monks just offers to pick the gal up and carry her across and she accepts and he picks her up in his arms and carries her across sets her down comes back across the river, joins the other monk, and they go down the road. And about an hour later, uh, the monk, the other monk, who did not carry the woman, uh, just can't stand it any longer. And he says to the monk who did carry the woman, how could you? We're not even supposed to look at women. Don't you realize the dangers of temptation, even looking at, much less touching a woman? 
And the other monk's response was, are, are you still carrying that woman with you? I left her back by the river. And that's how we all carry the past with us. We don't live in the moment. On the other hand, thinking about the future. Maybe we have to do an unpleasant job. For me, it's having to do the dishes. I uh, don't want to do it. I have better things to do. So therefore, I'm not in the moment. I'm thinking about what I'd rather be doing, what I might be doing in the future. I'm not, you know, I'm just, I'm not in the moment. I'm not being myself in the moment. So it's very difficult to live in the present. No worries, as the Rastafarians might say. Uh, you know, Socrates, Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, and this examination is supposed to be continual, so that one is always in the moment, being oneself, and fully alive. Because if we live in the past, the past is no longer here. So we're not living. If we're living in the future, the future is not yet here. So we're not living. So the only place we can live is in the present. And how often are we not in the present? So the remaining slides in this PowerPoint have to do with uh, just presenting some of the therapeutic philosophers, philosophers whose philosophies were more therapeutic than they were theoretical, uh, though, again, there's plenty of theory uh, in, in their work as well. And uh, I'm just realizing that the slide doesn't say the Stoics on it. Well, this slide is the Stoics. Uh, of course, not all the Stoics, but three of the biggies. Zeno of Chitium actually was the founder of uh, Stoicism. By the way, the Stoics were called Stoics because they met in a, an area outside the wall of Athens in a colonnade, and the Latin word for column is Stoa, so they became Stoics. Uh, we don't have hardly any of Zeno's writings, uh, if any, um, so unfortunately we don't know much about him. Epictetus is the greatest of the Stoics, and I've told you a little bit about him. I recommend his discourses and the Enchiridion or Handbook. And then Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic uh, who was also a Roman emperor, two jobs that don't go together well, because the Stoic is supposed to be very frugal, not be concerned with worldly possessions, uh, etc., control one's diet, all that kind of stuff. And of course, the emperor is supposed to be about be ostentatious and wear the, the, the imperial purple and go to banquets and go to the Colosseum and all these things, and Marcus Aurelius hated it. Anyway, his uh, book, The Meditations, is another s essential book that everybody should probably have on their bookshelves. Uh, wonderful book of his own uh, Florilegium, his own collection of, uh, I, you know, of, of sayings for his own use. Well, I guess that was uh, PowerPoint being tricky with me. I guess that previous slide did say the Stoics on it, but when I opened it uh, in the view that I'm on right now, can't see that. Um, at any rate, here are the Epicureans. Epicurus, of course, the founder. Lucretius, who wrote a book called De Rerum Natura on Natural Things, uh, a philosophical poem, uh, kind of philosophical cosmology. Um, the Epicureans were hated basically by everybody, pagan, Christian, Jewish, because they were thought to be uh, A, they were thought to be atheists, and B, they were thought to be hedonists. Now, as to the charge of atheism, you saw the, the uh, tet tetrapharmacos at the beginning of this, where they said God presents no fears because they essentially thought that the gods had nothing to do with human beings, that, human be that gods just simply didn't care about human beings. So uh, they got charged with being atheists, though I think they were more really agnostics. Uh, but that's a distinction that didn't make a lot of difference in the ancient world. So many of their books were destroyed for that reason, uh, and they were tended to be ignored uh, or shunned. Um, they were also thought to be hedonists. Hedonism, H-E-D-O-N-I-S-M, is uh, the principle of seeking pleasure as the goal of human life. Now, the Epicureans certainly were Epicurean in the modern sense, that is. They were lovers of, you know, moderate pleasure. But they were Greek. It was moderate pleasure. In fact, for the Epicureans, the highest pleasure was the absence of pain. So they were not hedonists in the sense of, you know, wine women and, and, and just, you know, drunken brawls and stuff like that. They were 
you know, moderate in, in, in their, in their, uh, in the pleasures that they sought. So, um, I think they get a bad rap. I think their stuff is worth reading. Unfortunately, we've lost an awful lot of it, uh, already in ancient times. So what you're going to do with these slides of the therapeutic philosophers is there is an extra credit question on the review sheet that asks you to give three short biographies, like one paragraph, two paragraph biographies of three therapeutic philosophers. Uh, my goal here is just really to give you an opportunity to become familiar with three philosophers who otherwise we might not cover in the class. So you can pick any three of the philosophers that I've listed here in these slides. Uh, on the last slide, I've also given you some other options of philosophers you can look up. And um, as to sources, you can use any sources you want, but it would be nice if you would cite them. Uh, and it would also be nice if you wrote your little biography in your own words as much as possible. Uh, here are the Neo three of the great Neoplatonists. Plotinus has always kind of gotten pride of place, uh, but I think that was more a bias in, uh, on the part of early modern scholars. Who, who liked the fact that he didn't have any kind of weird ritual magic and, or divination or ritual practices or any of that kind of stuff in his writings. Um, and therefore, they were also biased against Iamblichus, who has all of that stuff. The early modern scholars tended to view that as superstitious nonsense and beneath a scholar's attention. And so that element of ancient Greek philosophy has not really been studied well until very recently. Now, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there are some exciting developments in the study of Hellenistic philosophy, uh, the influence of Egyptian religion on Hellenistic philosophy, uh, etc., and uh, so it, it, it's a great time to be studying any of these schools. Proclus was probably about the most systematic philosopher out of all these guys. In fact, he wrote a book called The Elements of Platonic Theology that is axiomatic. That is, he starts with very basic truths or axioms. Uh, Greek, would be, uh, Greek plural would be axiomata. But at any rate, he starts with very simple principles, these axioms that are, you know, just obviously true, like nothing comes from nothing. Uh, classic, one of the most ancient uh, of thoughts. Uh, in Latin, it's nihilo ex nihil fit. Um, and then he just, you know, he, he gives the first axiom that is obviously true, the second axiom that's obviously true, and then if you take the first axiom and the second axiom together, they produce the third axiom, and you just kind of keep building uh, in, a, in a kind of in, kind of in the same way that Euclid developed his geometry. So if you ever go back and look at Euclid's geometry, the first great uh, systematization of uh, the knowledge of geometry, same kind of text where you just start with basic principles and keep building and building and building in a rational way. Now we'll turn to some of the modern proponents of therapeutic philosophy. Wittgenstein is an interesting one because he's considered an analytic philosophy. And of course, therapeutic philosophy really is more of a continental uh, way of doing philosophy. But in its early days, analytic philosophy was very revolutionary, really wanted to change how philosophy was done. And Wittgenstein certainly did that. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the philosophical investigations are based on his teaching. And uh, he, you know, he he had a tendency to to his philosophy students to say, you know, essentially quit thinking so much and just look, just look at your ideas, look at the problem, uh, don't let ideas get in the way of your analysis. Um, so, for example, uh, just the kind of a dumb example, I might say, uh, if I was Wittgenstein, I might say, uh, you know, class, where do you keep your ideas? Everybody, point to where you keep your ideas. And when you had pointed to your head, he would say something like, well, as it happens, I have bu I brought along my bone saw. Can we cut open your head and look at your ideas? Thereby pointing out that ideas are not like toys in a toy box. They're not things. The relationships between ideas are not like the relationships between, th between things. But what happens, uh, uh, Wittgenstein says, is because we have a disease of language, we become infected by the meanings of our sentences 
into thinking they tell us things that are true, as if ideas are things. That's what our language seems to say. You know, you hold an idea in your head, do you really? With what little bitty hands you've got in your head? I mean, it doesn't make, you know, our language confuses us into thinking uh, it really kind of reifies things, and that's a real danger. And so he thinks instead of looking at, uh, you know, instead of trying to analyze language in terms of, uh, you know, uh, logical arg uh, arguments and, and, and making valid arguments and that kind of thing, Wittgenstein focuses instead on uh, the what he calls family resemblances between concepts, the way in which concepts don't have a specific essence, but mean what they mean because of all of their relationships to all, all of the other concepts uh, in, in that same general area. And he says, you know, these concepts in this way form what he calls language games. And he doesn't mean game as in it's play, uh, though in a sense I guess it's that, but in the sense that it has rules. There are rules for using language in different language games. You don't use the same language game when you go to the doctor's office as you do at the bank, unless you want them to think you're, you know, uh, nuts or something. So, it, you know, he has all of these wonderful concepts for getting past or avoiding some of the obvious uh, uh, pitfalls and dangers of traditional logical thinking. Uh, McIntyre, uh, Alistair McIntyre, is an ethicist. He is the really founding father of what is called virtue ethics, uh, an attempt to return to some of the kind of traditional ethical practices that we discussed uh, uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, by the way, Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations is pretty easy to read, but it's much more helpful to read if you, uh, after you've studied philosophy for a few years. It's really like an antidote to too much philosophy in many ways. McIntyre, on the other hand, is a real pain to read. His sentences, uh, almost every sentence, you kind of have to sit there and unpack. But I think that's what he wanted us. He wanted us to slow down and weigh every thought carefully. His, basically, his basic attitude is that ethics arises, uh, a philosophical ethics arises, when there's a need for it, when there's a crisis. And that the, the, um, the way in which we interpret moral terms has not kept up with the uh, developments in society. And he thinks we're in a period like that now, where philosophers should have a role, as they did in ancient Athens, uh, in redefining the traditional the traditional moral terms, uh, bringing them up to date, making them uh, work for us today. Gadamer uh, is a uh, practices hermeneutics, H E R M E N E U T I C hermeneutics. Uh, it's uh, methods of interpretation, um, and the the book Truth and Method is kind of a history of modern hermeneutics, which really begins, some of the practices go back a ways, but hermeneutics itself begins with Friedrich Schleiermacher in uh, right about 1800. And Gadamer is concerned that, uh, uh, for the possibility of communication, that there can actually be communication between a reader and a text, or even between two other human beings, or between, you know, uh, different elements of society or whatever. And he likens the participants in a communication to horizons. Each one has their own presuppositions. There is no presuppositionless starting point. Uh, you know, science says they're going to start without presuppositions. Well, Gadamer just, uh, and most uh, people who practice hermeneutics, just don't think such a, a presuppositionless starting point is even possible. Instead, uh, one, if, it's, if we're talking about communication between two people, uh, let's say person A has their horizon. They have their own context, they have their own meanings, they have their own assumptions. Person B has their own. And so the possibility of communication would seem to be very small. But, Gadamer says, uh, there are elements in each of their horizons that uh, will allow a bridging of those horizons and ultimately a fusion of those horizons. They won't become completely the same, but they will be able to uh, sort of co-penetrate one another. And so there will be communication at the, when the two horizons uh, sort of overlap, if you will.
Uh, anyway, very interesting. Gadamer's writings on Plato are wonderful. Uh, it's a very, uh, it, it really kind of uh, amazingly optimistic philosophy for the Emmanuel Levinas was a, a Jewish postmodernist, um, and it's significant that he was Jewish because he wrote as much on Jewish theology as he did on uh, philosophy. His uh, main point of attack was the idea that metaphysics is first philosophy. That's what Aristotle called it, first philosophy. Metaphysics is first philosophy, Aristotle said, because its main topic is being, which is really the first concept in terms of importance, because being is the only concept that applies to all things. If it can be thought, it has being. If it doesn't have being, it can't be thought. And so metaphysics is first philosophy. Levinas wants to say no, uh, because that puts the theoretical ahead of the practical and, uh, and ahead of the moral, and therefore ethics should be first philosophy. And so most of his writings are oriented toward making that alteration in the philosophical tradition. His writings are quite difficult to read, but I know from personal experience that if you spend a lot of time reading phenomena, the literature of phenomenology, which is another 20th century philosophical development, uh, it opens up Levinas's text and they make a lot more sense when you, once you have a handle on some of that uh, phenomenological terminology. So it is difficult. Uh, the other thing you can do with some of these modern writers, such as Levinas, is get their lectures. Or in the case of Levinas, he's got a wonderful book of just like one and two page uh, summaries of his lecture courses. So it's like a summary of his entire philosophy. It's wonderful. Um, with people like Mark Taylor, um, you know, I haven't looked up videos of him particularly. On the next slide, we'll see Jacques Derrida. He has many videos. Uh, in fact, there's a movie, a documentary made about Derrida called Derrida. Uh, Taylor was one of the first American postmodernists. And I really put this book up here not because he's a major philosopher per se, but because this book is a good introduction to postmodernism. Um, and uh, like most potter, most postmodern books, will probably uh, you know upset a lot of people. Uh, it begins with the death of God and gets more challenging from there. But if you're up for the challenge, I think this is a good uh, first book in postmodernism, though certainly it doesn't answer all the questions. Jacques Derrida is one of the most influential and important philosophers of the 20th century. Uh, his major concern, um, well, let's uh, talk first actually about his development of the method of deconstruction. Deconstruction is kind of a reverse engineering in philosophy. Reverse engineering uh, is when a, a, a computer, uh, a person who's doing computer code, takes a piece of code and takes it apart uh, sort of in reverse in order to see how it went together in the first place so that they can improve it or change it or, or steal it or whatever. Um, so in philosophy, deconstruction is, is like reverse engineering. Uh, Derrida was convinced, as other postmodernists like Leotard also were, that um, they that you know that we have all of these systems, whether social systems or uh, theoretical systems or scientific systems or mathematical systems that seem to be self-explanatory, that seem to be consistent with themselves and explain everything. And he was convinced that, you know, that uh, largely was not the case, that really what is sort of primordial, what is sort of um, at the heart of things is a lack of closure. And if we're going to find ways to advance social openness and uh, inclusiveness, etc., then we need to find how these systems went together and deconstruct them so we can see how they went together and therefore find more room within them for otherness, for, uh, for freedom, essentially. Uh, Jean-Luc Marion uh, was a, is, I think he's still living. If he is, he's quite old and just barely living, but at any rate, Marion was a, fr a conservative French Roman Catholic postmodernist, but he was really using postmodernism kind of in the service of some of the uh, 
uh, traditional Catholic mystical traditions. Uh, very interesting stuff, as you can tell by the title, God Without Being. Very challenging stuff as well. I mentioned Michel Foucault before. Um, Foucault, well, he did a lot of, I mean, he had he had a, quite a career, and he developed, uh, his thought developed considerably over a long period of time. But most of his earlier writings were fairly cynical with regard to the, uh, the possibility of social change and the possibility of really changing institutions. Uh, he claimed that, you know, social institutions are sort of... Uh, he called them governmentalities, but what he means is like matrices or combinations of power, language, and knowledge. So, for example, when you go to the doctor, the first thing that happens, they take your information. You don't get their information, they take your information, because who has the power? Who has, you know, who has power over the, the knowledge? They, so you fill out all the forms and everything, and then you wait, because the doctor's time is more important than yours. There's power again. And then when the doctor sees you, uh, half of the things he says you might not even understand because they're in some kind of professional language uh, or technical language that you may or may not get. So there's all of this influence of power language. And not, you think of it, I mean, when you're filling out mortgage papers, right, how much of it do you understand? The lawyers understand it, but do you? So Foucault also, like Derrida, wanted to open up space within these systems so that we could really have real substantive change. And he seemed pretty uh, pessimistic about that up, into, up to the late 1970s. And in the 1970s, he writes his great three-volume work on the history of sexuality. And as part of that, he went back and looked at uh, ideas of sexuality in the Hellenistic period. And that got him interested in Hellenistic philosophy. And in the last years of his life, as I mentioned earlier, he did a series of lectures at the Collège de France on uh, Hellenistic philosophy, and they are quite brilliant. Um, and he really thought this might be the possibility that he was looking for, for real social change, is in the transformation and the transformability of human nature. Just to give you one example of the kind of analysis he does, he divides uh, care of the self, uh, Hellenistic ideas on care of the self, uh, philosophy as a way of life, care of the self, or, uh, well, he analyzes all these terms, but at any rate, four ways of doing, uh, I guess you could say, uh, care of the self. One, cognitive, looking at the self, examining the self, paying attention to the self. Uh, or, you know, movement of existence. We talked about con conversion and metanoia, turning toward oneself. Those are two ways. The third would, a way of caring for the self would be uh, these metaphors, uh, medical metaphors, legal metaphors, religious metaphors, uh, and the metaphor of having a constant relationship to oneself. Uh, different activities and conduct one does in regard to the self. And then finally, uh, designating a constant relationship to oneself. I, th I see I have something duplicated there, so uh, letter D should actually be number four. Sorry about that. A relationship of mastery and sovereignty, a relationship of sensations, um, dif different ways of relating to the self. So, um, you know, this is the kind of analysis that Foucault provides us. So it's a really, you know, very uh, understandable. He doesn't use a lot of technical language. And his analysis uh, or his analyses of uh, Hellenistic texts are just brilliant and, and well worth buying that book. And here's Pierre Hadot. Hadot, as I said back in the 40s and 50s, really revitalized the idea of philosophy as a way of life pretty much single-handedly and was a major influence on Foucault himself. Uh, all of his books are worth reading. The essay that you're reading, Spiritual Exercises, comes from a book called Philosophy as a Way of Life, um, and he has a number of others that are equally worth uh, reading. I mentioned the one on nature, The Veil of Isis. little quote from Tim Leary and Alan Watts, um, I think kind of sums it all up. So all that's left is on the next slide, there's a list of other therapeutic philosophers 
uh, uh, you know, you can pick any of the any of the ones I've mentioned or the ones on the next slide. Or if you have someone else you think fits the bill, just let me know, and you can probably write on those. Again, that's for the extra credit on the review sheet. It's not a separate extra credit uh, assignment, but it is for the extra credit on the review sheet on practices. And here's some more therapeutic philosophers who you might want to take a look at. Again, one paragraph on three, each of the three ought to be enough. Um, so that concludes the uh, presentation on practices of philosophy, on Hellenistic philosophy. Uh, and I believe the next topic in line is logic. Till then.